All right, hello and welcome to the Wikibrands Collective webcast. Uh, my name is Doyle Bueller, and we are an on-demand collective of professional transformation talent that is rocking the boat on the wave of disruption. And this is the digitalization series where our panel looks at the arc of digitalizing companies and putting them on a digital first path. I'm delighted to be joined by our guest, Jeff Deschambeau is head of story for Dobson Telescope out of Toronto and Sean Moffat, the managing director of Wikibrands in Toronto. And as I said, my name is Doyle Bueller, CEO of Department of Digital. So let's quickly get an introduction. Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So um, let's see. So my background originally, I guess, is through mathematics and philosophy. And then I moved into the business strategy boutique consulting space where I met Sean, God, about a decade ago. Oh, wow. And then, yeah. It's, I staggered or shocked by just how quickly time flies. People were warning me my entire life, but here we are. Uh, and, and so from, from there, yeah. So after research, moved into consulting space and spent a lot of time looking at process design and uh, along the entire way, investigating story. And uh, I've now you know, gone out on my own and you know, put together a Dobson Telescope, which is essentially a legal entity that allows me to build my friends who run companies um, for access to the thinking and um, just kind of bouncing around ideas, strategizing, figuring out plans, and then um, dovetailed in with that, uh, doing a lot of research on internet memes, where that meets artificial intelligence, and then, yeah, with kind of story as the through line through all that. Wow, sounds fascinating. I think we'll, we'll have to get you back on in a couple episodes. <laughs> My brain's already delighted. going, wow. <laughs> all right, <laughs> cool, thanks, Jeff. And uh, Sean, just a quick little intro. Yeah, uh, Managing Director of Wikibrands, um, Certainly early in my career, technology was probably less core to what I did as a job and uh, kind of the pin drop for me, maybe in my later 20s, where it's just like, man, oh, man, I better catch up uh, to this world around me. I was kind of entranced by it. And so we're going to talk about digitalizing today. But I think there are there's an entire world still out there that needs to catch up to what's going on and to develop a, a kind of a digital first mindset. So, yeah, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about is how do we digitalize companies and put them on this digital first path. So um, uh, Jeff, you want to start first, like what are sort of a couple of things that you consider the industry at large helps us think about digitalizing? Sure. So, um, well, I guess just to kind of like tie it into my own experience over the, the last couple of weeks, uh, did you guys see the headlines about um this latest piece of artificial intelligence alpha star that beat human players at StarCraft? No. I've okay, seen so chess recently, but uh, um, go ahead. You have Okay. Control. Well, so yeah. actually, so I kind of want to, so I have like a, a personal link to that because as a kid, I mean, I played way too many video games. StarCraft was among them. And so when this headline kind of came down the pipeline of, you know, hey, there's this game, and like I, I understand the complexity of it. And, you know, we've got some of the best human players in the world and they're getting their clock cleaned by this piece of oh, artificial right. yeah, intelligence. Yeah, I hear about that. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, oh. I mean, yeah, like, so I remember my dad was uh, telling me ages ago about how he remembers when the first human-to-human -human heart transplant happened. And that was just kind of like this shot that was heard around the world. And now, not saying, you know, that obviously completely different examples, but, you know, having this game, the system that I'm so intimately or was intimately familiar with now being bested, you know, that kind of strikes personally. And, and then it got me thinking about like, wow, like, you know, back in the day, you know, the heart transplant, that was this crazy thing that happened. And, you know, a couple of years later, there was some new technological development. Well, like the AlphaGo news, I mean, that's just the most recent example, like the rate at which these, you know, shots heard across the world are happening now. I, I mean, it, it's kind of overwhelming. And so that kind of got me thinking about like, okay, so that's like a cool new piece of technology, but now like a, a heart transplant. I mean, yeah, it's technological, but is it really technological? So like, we're talking about technology and digitizing and the impact that it has, but like, when does something stop being a technology and just start being a part of life? And what are the new technologies coming down the pipeline that are going to be following that arc? So like, yeah, I guess kind of like as an opening frame, like when does a dishwasher stop being technology? And like, when is that going to happen to big data? Yeah, well, that's interesting. So if, um, uh, what was the name of the game again? Starcraft 2. Starcraft, okay. So yeah. once once AI sort of learns how to play video games, does that mean it's going to kind of relax and sit on the couch and <laughs> play video <sighs> games the rest of it? <laughs> oh, God, I, I only wish. So, I mean, like, well, 
so the skills in that are like transplanted to so many things. So basically, like the, the premise of the game is that, you know, there's three alien races, you know, think of chess, but with like more pieces and more possibility. And instead of like a, a confined space, uh, both in terms of like um, geography, but also decision space, uh, you've got like way more stuff to contend with. And so, you know, they, they drop the AI in this game. And first things first, you have to do economy management. You have to collect these resources and you have to manage the, the production of all of your, your various combat units. And then you take them off into battle. And of course your opponent's doing the same thing. And like, I look at this interface and it, it's not hard to imagine a situation where someone has a company or, you know, a real time battlefield or anything like that. And you have this kind of God's eye view camera and you're able to see everything. And through this amazing interface, um, you're able to have your commands abstracted away and you can literally do like the hierarchical functions of like many, 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 many layers of people in one go. So that's like super cool in terms of skills that a human would get maybe from this or that we can transplant into other industries. But then you take that and you say, well, geez, now we've got an artificial intelligence that is not only outperforming at the economic management, but also outperforming at the, the strategic management. And then even down to like, a, they call it ATM or actions per minute. And mm -hmm. so there's this count in all these competitive games, basically how many verbs, you know, you select the unit, you tell it to go over here, you make this thing, you make that thing. Well, so the AI, as you're watching it, it's even more like in, in some instances, it's doing way more actions per minute and they had to artificially limit that. But in others, it's doing like a fraction, uh, fewer actions per minute. So it's doing the same things with fewer actions, like it's more, more elegance or grace than the humans. So like, wow. I, yeah, I see this as like, I mean, it can go in, in, in so many directions, but that you can take such like a fundamentally unstructured thing like this and boom, it works, it, it, it's mind blowing. And, and the way they did it is incredible too, it's beyond what any human could do. So they, they, they taught the AI, the kind of the, the core verbs that would be required to interact with the game as a system. And then uh, do you guys watch Black Mirror? Do you see the Christmas special? Uh, I didn't see that one, but I've watched a oh. few of them, yeah. Okay, so I'll just boil it down to the, the bare thing. So there's this one plot where they, they take people basically and they clone their consciousness and they put it into a piece of technology. And then you're not limited by time, you're limited by clock speed. And so in the space of a second in real human time, the person inside the system uh, would experience the passage of time of months or years or centuries. So that's what they did to the artificial intelligence. They created the first instance of it and then they cloned it many, many times. And then they put it through 200 years of continuous gameplay against itself so that it started forming this ladder. And throughout those 200 years of play, uh, it was kind of this, um, what was it, uh, uh, a reinforcement learning feedback loop. And so the game was able to, or the AI, the agents as they call them, was able to optimize its way to all of these solutions, some of which were part and parcel with the orthodoxy of professional players. And some of them, it was just throwing away these sacred truths that these human professionals had been kind of adhering to for years and years. So really, really fascinating to see like, you know, these professionals who are like watching the game and they're commenting on it like a sports feed. And they're saying, oh, you know, the AI is not doing this thing. As professional players, we, we know that that's not the right thing to do. But then the thing comes around and, you know, it, it makes itself hurt. <laughs> Yeah, cool. Thanks, Jeff. That's quite the sounds pretty amazing. Um, Sean, what what would sort of what would be your highlight of um, uh, digitalization? Well, I've got a brave admission that I don't even want to give Jeff here because uh, <laughs> you know, as much as I love uh, Madden and a few of the other kind of video games, I'm not a huge gamer myself. I kind of look at technology when uh you can floor joe or josephine citizen with oh my god it's just hit that industry and now the whole world knows about it as opposed to the starcraft piece which we completely geeked out on and i completely get uh, the two things i've run across i mean i've been um, fixated on how digital first companies uh in retail are going to happen and happen with greater frequency over the next year everybody's seen the amazon go kind of self-checkout thing where there truly is no staff in that store and it just monitors what you do and you can actually leave the store without having any kind of exchange with anybody. This is here and today. I know even in Canada, we've got retailers that over the course of the next year will be implementing something similarly. So have, have um, you guys ever experienced and experienced that yourself yet? Um, I haven't made it yeah. down to San Francisco yet. I don't know if you've, uh, no? you've okay. sampled the self-checkout there. 
Well, so I, um, so this is kind of bad, but uh, my favorite self checkout is McDonald's because then I don't have to confront in the, you know, the experience of another human that I am in fact yeah. ordering that with the intention to eat it. <laughs> and it, it certainly helps when there's a language barrier too. <laughs> Absolutely. Nutritional issues going on with you up there, but yeah. I you know way, you're uh, every so often because I, uh, uh, so hockey is going back 15 years in time again and putting a chip in the puck. And so starting next year, their commissioner said, look, we will be tracking both player movement and puck movement throughout an entire game. And so it opens up a Pandora's box in terms of Canada's national sport here, in terms of a wave of analytics that will probably find it difficult to interpret to begin with, right? Like, what's the optimal feet between defensemen and how many kilometers a game should be somebody skating? uh and so can, can um, they put a camera in it too i don't know like that would probably be a pretty uh jittery scenario if you're putting a camera in the puck right we talk about yeah, they can digitally stabilize it effect. yeah uh, well, there's a you would so with the uh when the the wachowskis had a bunch of success with the first matrix movie and uh they they were given more money than god i remember watching the dvd extras on um the, the second one and the director of photography is like yeah, because we're doing so many shots completely digitally now, we've untethered the camera physically from the the space. And so where my mind goes to when I hear what you're describing is like, okay, we've got all of the, the data points. Um, we're getting to the point where it's not too expensive to render things that look almost photorealistic. Would people be willing to accept like a, a digital camera if it allowed them to engage with the game in a different way? So you could totally get that puck view. You could get, you know, point of view from the players. You could do all sorts of wild stuff. And that's completely setting aside like the, the ridiculous amount of data that can then be used to optimize. I mean, you could plug AlphaGo into it. Mm, yeah, no, for <laughs> sure. Star, like... One of the highlights that I've seen this past week, I don't know if you guys have, was the um, this new fast uh, 3D printer. Um, and I'm, I mentioned it uh, earlier in the week, but one of my startups back in 2002 was dealing with 3D printing in sort of the consumer space. And the technology wasn't quite there, but... Um, the technology demonstrator that they created this week, or at least that they showed, was they're spinning the vat of epoxy and they're projecting sort of a 3D image into this vat. And it actually creates the object from the inside out while this vat of epoxy is um, photosensitive epoxy is rotating. So within like three minutes, it actually is able to produce these um, uh, objects. I mean, they, they obviously have some rough edges uh, to be able to deal with, but that it looks like fascinating in terms of what they're able to do. I won't be investing in an international supply chain anytime soon. No, no, for sure. Um, so we've got a couple of uh, products coming up, right, uh, Sean? We've got um, uh, the fifth workshop lab. Do you want to kind of give a quick rundown on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's probably not based on priority. I think it's uh, they're just as important as any of the others. But we've we've managed to launch workshops and labs about scaling companies and about reinventing uh, brands and about transforming companies. Um, starting, I guess, as this pod as this, this webcast airs, we'll be launching a workshop and lab called Digitalize. That's what we're talking about today, and it is an attempt for us at Wiki Brands and our collective of talent to get inside companies and actually deal with some of the, the maybe less romanticized notions around technology, but actually how do you become a digital first company? How do you build that mindset? And then how do you make it happen inside your company? And so that'll take- Un Unromantically, as uh, you said. Well, I think there is some <laughs> romance and we'll get to it in terms of the storytelling angle that we're gonna take on this. Because it's interesting yeah. when you look at digitalize and CIOs and people that are probably in those spaces, they're probably not the most developed right brain people, um, you know, mm. uh, and I think couching all of what we're kind of, kind of wanting to do in a story based um, uh, scenario makes a lot of intuitive sense for people. I think there's there's an arc and a journey to actually any type of change, including digitalizing yeah. companies. And I think taking this approach that we've taken with this uh, workshop and lab is going to be an important part in terms of cool. how we so it's with ourselves and how we we have that accepted by the clients that we work with. So it's wiki-brands.com slash digitalize lab. And I've got yeah. it on the screen there. So excellent. And that kind of leads into sort of our last point, uh, Jeff. And if you wouldn't mind, we sort of a little bit pressed for time here. But uh, can you quickly talk 
to us about your seven part storytelling approach and how that kind of fits with all this. Sure. So, um, well, I, I, so from all my time studying this and, you know, taking um, the, the Elon Musk advice of, you know, going back to first principles, you know, was working on all these different types of content over my career, you know, um, white papers, presentations, speeches, articles, like you name it. And it was like, okay, like, um, one of the values that I inherited is if you're going to be doing something more than once, you want to optimize the process. And so I was like, looking for what is the, the Uber or process that kind of can structure all of this? And so that led me to studying story. And it's like, okay, so what is a story? I mean, we talk about them all the time. And basically, I mean, you've got your before and you've got your after. Well, I'm not sure how the, the frame is flipped, but hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and um, so the story is, is something that happens in between. And so by kind of relentlessly analyzing that and teasing it apart and like literally starting from nothing and then building it up from scratch, I found that a, a story is really, it's the journey of a character from the world that they know into the unknown and through grappling with and struggling with that unknown, they learn and grow and they change. And then they take all that new information with realization and they integrate it into both their thinking and their behavior. And, um, and so, yeah, so that, I, I mean, it, it sounds uh, kind of un unceremonious, but it's um, that process, whether you're learning how to ride a bike, learning a new skill, you know, making rockets that can you know, catch themselves and, and land on a, a launch pad, they all decompose into these same seven parts that can then be recursively applied against itself to generate as much detail as possible. So what Sean and I did is uh, we started at like the, the, the most fundamental level. Like we can go back to Aristotle who gave us the, in poetics, literally the definition of beginning, middle and end. And it's like, okay, so if that's the simplest way you can think of the story, what is the simplest story that we do? And uh, let's see, uh, can you remember the verbs offhand? I think I've got them. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, let's see, it was, uh, index, distill, select. So kind of uh, for, for everything that we are striving to do, you know, you've got all this stuff out in the world. Well, what we offer is an index of, you know, okay, for this problem, there are these technologies. And you know, bring us in and look at, okay, what is relevant to the problem that you're working at, which is the distillation. And then finally, the kind of making it real is the, the selection process of it. So with that kind of fundamental archetypal story for us in mind, we then went through across all of our content and used that as kind of the scaffold or the skeleton and then brought in the, so that's three parts, we brought in the additional four and then tailored them to each of the examples. So that then allows us to have this entire system of content that superficially might look different, but at the, the kind of meta hidden structural level, it's all kind of resonant on, on the same core theme. So yeah, yeah. it's been, it's well, been it's, an exciting process. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds really exciting. And actually, Jeff, um, uh, we, we should talk some more. We should bring you back on. I, I did uh, two presentations just this week where we've integ I've integrated sort of storytelling into uh, strategy and, and digital management and that sort of thing. So love to have you back. Exactly. Um, yeah, Sean, um, just quickly, anything you want to wrap up with as well? No, I know uh, we will bring Jeff back because I think there is yeah. a story within the story here. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, yep. about, There's always another the level. The fusion of uh, Jeff has spent the greater part of a decade just kind of looking at the entire arena of the story and to marry that with digitalization by industry, uh, by discipline, uh, and by type of technology. So we'll have 36 different distinct flavors of story that depending on what you want as a client, we'll have a, um, a set of tools and um, kind of content that will be very bespoke and tailored to whoever needs it. So I'm excited about Fantastic. That. Yeah, absolutely. We've got some amazing stuff. Cool. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, for uh, being part of this and uh, to our viewers thanks for watching watching and listening to the wiki brands collective the digitalized webcast go to wiki-brands.com webcast for more episodes like this on some of our other amazing think tank discussions uh, thanks to our guests uh, jeff deschambeau and of course uh, sean moffat and myself if you learned something please like and share or simply ask us a question and we'll respond as quickly as possible we have some amazing shows coming up as well on the wiki brands collective webcast take a look at wiki brands or wiki-brands.com webcast to find out more thank you and we will see you online have a good evening gentlemen thank, thank you so much take care